outfits in Euphoria. HBO's Euphoria stars an array of popular young actors like Zendaya, Jacob Elordi, Hunter Schaefer, Barbie Ferreira, Alexa Demi, Maude Apatow, and Sydney Sweeney. The series, which has recently completed its second season and has been confirmed for a third, follows a group of high school students as they struggle with friendship, love, drugs, and sex. Released in 2019, the series has been both commended and criticized for its subject matter and visuals, with some viewers praising its mature storyline, while others have called it all style with no substance. Whether you love the show or hate it, there's no denying the impact Euphoria has had since its release, with numerous other young adult series attempting to replicate its formula with little success. Besides catapulting some of its lesser-known actors to fame, Euphoria has also made quite the impression on the fashion world, with the show serving as inspiration for a variety of contemporary beauty and style trends. With a team that includes costume design by Heidi Bevins, hair by Kim Kimball, makeup by Donnie Davey, and nails by Natalie Minerva, Euphoria's wardrobe department has consistently showcased some of the most innovative and inspiring looks on TV in the last decade, and I'm not joking when I say that other shows should take notes. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at the six main female characters from Euphoria, Rue, Jules, Kat, Lexi, Cassie, and Maddie and we'll be examining how the costuming relates to their respective personalities and individual story arcs. Keep in mind that this isn't a review of the show itself, this is just an analysis of the costuming, and obviously there will be spoilers. I'd also like to give a content warning for those of you who are unfamiliar with Euphoria's subject matter. While I'll be doing my best to not go into too much detail, there will be mentions of substance abuse, mental illness, and sexual acts, as those are a large part of the show's storyline. If any of these things are something that you may find triggering, I wouldn't recommend watching this video. Let's get into it. Rue The show's narrator and the lead protagonist, Rue is played by former Disney darling Zendaya, who won an Emmy back in 2020 for her phenomenal portrayal of the struggling 17-year-old. The character herself is incredibly complex, self-destructive and volatile one moment but sweet and sensitive the next, making the audience root for her to succeed while simultaneously being disturbed by her actions. One of the most terrifying aspects of Rue's personality is her callousness, hitting you exactly where it hurts most, as seen when she fights with Jules, Fez, and Ali. The way that she continuously deflects and blames others for her own actions also reveals her mental and emotional immaturity, and that in spite of the things she's going through, she's still just a child in need of help and guidance. Diagnosed with severe ADD, OCD, depression, and anxiety from a very early age, Rue initially begins using drugs as a way to numb the pain of her day-to-day -day life, and begins to abuse a variety of substances following the death of her father as a way to cope. Her dependence on drugs affects her relationship with her friends as well as her family, and she finds herself utterly alone without anyone that she feels understands her. After returning from a rehab stint following an overdose, she seems to be doing better, but that couldn't be further from the truth. A full-blown addict, she is willing to say and do anything to get her next fix, constantly lying to her family and friends about her sobriety as well as manipulating those around her to get what she wants. She only becomes sober for real after meeting, befriending, and falling in love with the new girl in town, Jules, replacing one obsession with another. This is just the calm before the storm, however, and by the time the second season rolls around, she's up to her old tricks, even going as far as arranging to sell $10,000 worth of drugs, only to turn around and use it as her personal stash. Her unstable behavior eventually prompts an intervention, which goes poorly, and winds up destroying her relationship with several characters. Following this public breakdown, Rue becomes sober once again, and is able to mend some of the bridges that she had previously burned, and the second season ends with her revealing that she was able to stay sober for the rest of the school year, a happier ending than many viewers, including myself, had been predicting. Rue doesn't go through the most drastic personal evolution over the course of the series, spending the entirety of it fighting her addiction or giving into it, and as a result, her clothing remains consistent throughout. Often wearing bike shorts, baggy jeans, oversized t-shirts, and sneakers, Rue's style is comfortable and casual, with hints of androgyny that reflect both her gender identity and sexuality. Jules, I am deeply uncomfortable right now. 
This relaxed quality is also displayed in her makeup, with Rue either sporting a natural look or something more slapdash, differing wildly from the other girl's makeup which is more refined and thought out. Head of Euphoria's makeup department, Donnie Davey, said of Rue's look during the first season, quote, Rue is a drug addict, and my early thought with her was, wait, is she really wearing makeup? Would Rue really do that? Does she even know how to put on smudgy black eyeliner and shadow and draw gold triangles? Would she even care to do that? But then I realized in thinking that, I was doing the opposite of what I want to do for the show. I want to present makeup in nuanced, interesting ways, and I wanted to not have each character just be an archetype or a stereotype. While the makeup on Euphoria has been praised for ushering in an era of experimental beauty trends, it isn't just about looking good. It also serves a purpose in the story and reflects the character's state of mind. In Rue's case, she only ever wears makeup when she's in a highly reactive state, and it's often dark and smoky with glitter details, mirroring the character's lack of control and dire situation. In the first season, these rare makeup moments only occur after Rue meets Jules, who uses fashion as a form of self-expression, and this sentiment slightly rubs off on Rue. Rue's makeup, along with other characters, was purposely imperfect in order to capture the reality of teens today, with Donnie Davey saying in an interview with Vulture, quote, Generation Z learn makeup on the internet, and they get pretty good at it, but we always wanted to dial in a certain level of unpolishedness to give it that realism. Once she and Jules have a falling out, with Rue relapsing as a result, she stops wearing bold makeup entirely, partly because the character's addiction has become her priority, but also because wearing makeup is a painful reminder of her first love and her previous sobriety. Rue's clothing is fairly understated, allowing her to fade into the background at times, something you'd probably want to be doing if you were up to those types of shenanigans. Rue's laid-back wardrobe also helps the audience distance themselves from Zendaya's public persona. As one of the most fashionable and glamorous celebrities around, Zendaya's superstar quality has inadvertently resulted in one of the biggest criticisms of the show, which is its supposed glorification of substance abuse. Now, if you actually paid attention to the show, you'd know that that isn't the case at all and that those actions always have consequences. Unlike Effie Stoneham from Skins, for example, Rue's behavior and appearance aren't framed as aspirational, which was completely intentional on the wardrobe department's end. When designing Rue's costumes, Heidi Bevan said, quote, I want to be very careful about putting her in anything that feels fashionable because of viewers wanting to emulate her. I didn't want to make her a fashion plate. During the Halloween episode, she dresses as Marlena Dietrich's character in the 1930 film Morocco a film that is notable for including a same-sex kiss and for a female character wearing a tailcoat, something that was rather scandalous for the time period. It also features a love triangle, and at this point, Rue still believes that Jules is in love with Tyler. Now, do I personally think that Rue has seen Morocco? Not at all, but that doesn't make its intention less important. Marlena Dietrich openly defined sexual norms of her time period, dressing in what was widely considered male clothing and having affairs with both men and women. The choice to dress up as this character not only helps the audience understand more about Rue's gender identity, but also gives insight into how others see her. She's someone who breaks societal norms and expectations and is ostracized for it. Rue has a defined color palette that is made up of red, brown, and black. Black is often used to represent evil, despair, and misfortune, and considering Rue's struggling mental, physical, and emotional state, we can see why it makes so many appearances in her wardrobe. Black is also the color of darkness, which can be all-consuming and frightening, just like Rue's addiction. In season two, as she digs a deeper and deeper hole for herself, Black begins to dominate her wardrobe, with the character dressing less childishly, likely in an attempt to make herself appear more put together than she actually is. The color brown, ironically enough, symbolizes resilience, security, and dependability, but they culminate in destructive ways, like being overprotective of her sister, unhealthily reliant on jewels, and extremely determined to get her next high. Instead of wearing true reds, Rue opts for duller and darker shades, reflecting how the love and passion in her life have been negatively affected by her choices. Throughout the first season, Rue is often spotted in an oversized maroon hoodie, something that is eventually revealed to have belonged to her father. Because the hoodie and other items of the same color are worn repeatedly, it solidifies the impact her father's death had on Rue's life, not only stunting her emotionally, but also being the catalyst for her addiction, and this unresolved grief is the driving force behind all of her foolish actions. The hoodie makes fewer appearances in season two, 
First, because the costume designer thought that it made for less than interesting outfits, but secondly, because its presence racks Rue with guilt that she selfishly wants to escape from. In an interview with V Magazine, Heidi Bevan said, quote, To me, instinctively, it just didn't make sense to have this hoodie be with her every step of the way. It's a reminder of her father and a reminder of someone who loves her, so it's like the sense of conscience which she's trying to block out. Many elements of Rue's personal style take notes from fashion trends of the 1970s and 1990s, with tie-dye, graphic tees, boiler suits, and flared pants making regular appearances in her wardrobe, with many of these pieces actually being vintage. The 70s and 90s were time periods when youth drug use ran rampant, and while you could call it a reach, this could be a clever connection to the character's main struggle throughout the show as well as being symbolic of how Rue's issues, whether it's substance abuse or her declining mental health, are just as much a problem for youth today as it was 50 years ago. Rue also wears a lot of oversized clothing, which emphasizes how thin she is, which yes, has a lot to do with Zendaya herself, but also relates to how the character doesn't prioritize other aspects of her health. Some withdrawal symptoms include getting chills, and we often see Rue wearing jackets or sweaters in an attempt to stay warm, showing how the costuming also keeps in mind the physical hardships characters are going through. When the second season ends, Rue's style hasn't made any drastic changes, which makes me all the more excited for the next season of Euphoria because it'll be interesting to see how her sobriety affects how she dresses. Jewels Jules is the new girl in town, and over the course of the show, she wrestles with her gender identity and struggles with her complicated romantic feelings for various characters and how it relates to her own journey of self-discovery. While Jules appears happy and easygoing, she's had an incredibly traumatic past, including her mother forcibly placing her in a psychiatric hospital and numerous dangerous sexual encounters with strangers, which includes Nate's father, Cal, who records the tryst without her permission, unaware that Jules is underage. After meeting Rue, the two girls form a camaraderie and quickly become inseparable, which eventually results in the two starting up a romance. Being recognized as the reason behind Rue's newfound sobriety, Jules struggles with this responsibility as it reminds her of her own mother, who similarly was an addict. This, combined with being blackmailed by Nate, leads to Jules becoming more reckless as the season progresses, experimenting with drugs and alcohol. At the end of the season, Jules asks Rue to run away with her, only to be rebuffed, and their relationship is left strained and confused as a result. The two reunite in the second season, only for Jules to become jealous of Rue's budding friendship with Elliot, which eventually leads to Jules developing feelings for him herself, unaware that he's been enabling Rue's addiction. When she finds out about Rue's drug use, Jules stages an intervention with Rue's mother and Elliot, which results in Rue lashing out violently and cutting ties with all of them, and we end the season unsure if the two of them will ever fully make up. Jules's color palette is seemingly random, with the character wearing various shades of green, blue, pink, orange, purple, and yellow throughout the series. While it might seem like this is too many colors to hold any symbolic meaning, it's in fact the opposite. Besides being an obvious reference to her sexual identity, this wide array of colors also highlights her fickleness, creativity, playfulness, and youth. Jules starts the series wearing bright pastels, mirroring her character's more naive and hopeful mindset. But as she becomes more overwhelmed and upset about the things going on around her, the colors become more saturated or darker in tone, reflecting her bleak circumstances. Her expansive color palette also shows how the characters share similar attributes to other characters, like Maddie's sexuality, Cassie's desire for love, Kat's creativity, and Rue's stubbornness. In the second season, Jules continues to wear a wide range of colors, but in muted shades with dark accents, allowing the audience to see that no matter how hard she tries, she's still being haunted by the things in her past. Her makeup is more experimental than the other girls, featuring asymmetric shapes and bold colors that draw attention but might not necessarily be considered conventionally attractive. According to Donnie Davey, quote, a big part of Jules is fuck the rules, and we see her challenge beauty norms just as much as she does societal ones. A creative type, Jules's art form of choice is makeup, and like any artist, her work takes inspiration from her life. When she's falling for Tyler, she draws clouds on her eyes, a literal interpretation of the saying head in the clouds, and when she's upset about Nate, she paints on literal tears. As the series progresses, her makeup becomes darker and messier, symbolic of Jules's lack of control over her own life. 
During the second season, her looks are less in your face, but still just as symbolic, featuring references to her love triangle with Rue and Elliot, and her more aggressive behavior. The subtle shift in her makeup style also reveals to the audience that she's grown more confident in herself and is no longer equating her self-worth to her appearance. Another way that Jules expresses herself is through her hair, which changes dramatically over the course of the series. At the beginning of the show, the ends are dyed light pink, and she often wears it in loose waves, a more inviting and feminine styling choice. It remains this way as she becomes involved with Tyler and falls in love with him, with the pink now symbolizing this budding romance. After finding out Tyler was in fact Nate, she dyes her ends purple, still soft and optimistic, but not as naive or innocent as it was initially. Let's not forget that purple is the combination of red and blue, something that mirrors Jules's more melancholy approach to romance. After being blackmailed by Nate to file a false police report, she removes the dye from her hair entirely, attempting to shut down any emotions she may be feeling, whether they're positive or negative. As Jules' anger and resentment towards herself and Nate grows, she gets dark red highlights and wears her hair straight, creating a more intimidating visual, as if hoping it will give her strength. The red in her hair also foreshadows her passionate night with Anna and the connection between them. At the end of the season, she gets dramatic dark highlights that started her roots, a much more intense look than what she started the season off with. The color mirrors Jules' current mental state and her experimentation with drugs and alcohol, revealing that if she continues going down her current path, she may lose herself entirely to the darkness. She's able to regain control and comes into the second season with a whole new look. Her short bob is symbolic of the fresh start that she's desperate for and also reveals her new mindset about femininity. Jules expresses an interest in fashion, aspiring to go to college in New York and become a designer, and this passion is present in her wardrobe, which features more designer brands and trendy elements than the rest of the characters, at least in season one. Out of the bunch, her style is the most experimental, playing around with textures and layers in order to create a more dynamic visual, and with hints of futurism that make her look straight out of a sci-fi movie. There are also elements like space buns or layered shirts that take notes from the e-girl trend, which was just becoming popular around the time the show was filming. When Jules is happier and more confident, we see her bear more skin, but when the character is feeling fragile or scared, she covers up, an attempt to protect herself from harm. Many of Jules' outfits are made out of mesh or feature cutout details, which are symbolic of how close to the surface the character's emotions are and how she rarely tries to hide who she is. When the series begins, Jules' fashion choices are representative of her own ideas about femininity, resulting in the majority of her clothing featuring short skirts and tight tops in traditionally feminine colors. But as the series progresses and Jules reevaluates what femininity means and how the male gaze has affected her, her style becomes more androgynous and experimental, less stereotypically attractive. With the tennis skirts, sneakers, and fuzzy backpacks, Jules' style is a caricature of a schoolgirl, a male fantasy and her pastel color palette makes her literal eye candy, revealing how she feels pressured to overcompensate her femininity. According to the costume designer, quote, as we were receiving scripts and learning more about who Jules is and who she was becoming, we quickly began to understand that although she was looking for approval from men in the beginning, she quickly evolves into this more independent thinking person and is empowered. So she starts dressing less in a way that tries to get attention from men. You'll see that throughout the progression of the show where she's not as cutesy. This is best exemplified by Jules wearing pants to the winter formal at the end of the first season, a stark contrast to the Jules we were first introduced to who probably would have worn a dress to the event. Besides representing the character's identity, her changing style also reflects her circumstances, with her darker fashion choices mirroring the growing tension in her relationship with Rue and her complicated feelings for Nate and Elliot. Jules is an incredibly empathetic and sensitive person, to the point it's almost detrimental to her well-being, and her style is affected by those around her just as much as her mood is. As she gets closer to Rue, she begins sporting more hoodies and baggy pants, albeit with her own unique style and flair, and this represents the power Rue has over Jules emotionally. This is repeated once again when she starts a relationship with Elliot in season two, where she begins sporting oversized crewnecks and beaded necklaces. At the Halloween party, Jules dresses up as Juliet from Baz Luhrmann's 1996 film, Romeo and Juliet, which is significant for multiple reasons. The story features one of the most famous instances of star-crossed lovers in literary history, and while Jules obviously sees herself as Juliet, 
Who is her Romeo? On one hand, it could be Rue, who could be doomed to die at a young age just like Romeo if she doesn't get it together, or alternatively, it could be Nate, who Jules finds herself drawn to in spite of all the dangers he presents. More figuratively, you could also see Jules' costume as her being a fallen angel, someone who is no longer innocent or pure, and considering earlier that day she committed a crime, that's probably exactly how she feels. Cat. Kat starts off the series relatively insecure and introverted, something that only changes after she begins having casual sex and working as a cam girl, and she finds confidence in the fact that she, a self-identified fat girl, finally has power over others. However, this is all a facade, and deep down she worries that no one will actually love her and we see her regularly push people away who have her best interests at heart, and as a result we can see how deeply ingrained her self-loathing is. Kat seeks validation from others in order to feel powerful, and regularly does what other people want her to do in order to feel accepted, not realizing that she's hurting herself in the process. This dependency on others' approval is made most apparent by how she goes about losing her virginity, feeling pressured to do so only because her friends make her feel badly about it, and she almost instantly regrets it. Kat, remind me again how many guys you fucked and um, oh yeah, catfishing, that don't count. <laughs> Despite his best efforts to make her happy, Kat thinks her new boyfriend Ethan is boring, and she only continues seeing him because her friends approve. When she and Ethan finally break up, with Kat lying to get him to dump her, it's the result of her own self-sabotaging nature, and her character ends the season right where she started. At the beginning of the series, Kat's color palette is dark and her clothes simple, representing the character's lack of confidence and showing the audience how desperate she is to go unnoticed. According to the costume designer, Kat's outfits at this stage were heavily inspired by Enid from the 2001 film Ghost World, who is a cynical social outcast who develops an unhealthy relationship with an older man, something that actually mirrors Kat's situation to a T. With her skinny jeans, pinafores, and baby tees, Kat's style actually resembles Cassie's at this point, symbolic of how both girls are afraid of being ridiculed by their peers but desperately long to be accepted. Kat's style only evolves when she begins camming, taking notes from fetish wear and the punk movement. With corsets, chokers, platform boots, animal print, and latex, Kat is clearly playing a character, someone that she thinks other people will like and be attracted to. You'll also notice that she stops wearing her glasses out in public, an age-old movie makeover trope that in this specific circumstance could be a metaphor for Kat consciously choosing to ignore her problems, literally making herself blind to them. After her style becomes bolder, we see Kat wear black, green, and red regularly, with the latter symbolizing love, passion, anger, and power. Many of the lingerie pieces she wears while being a cam girl are this color, and when she finally decides to stop feeling ashamed of her size, she wears an all-red outfit at the mall, garnering attention from dozens of men. One of her most memorable red outfits is what she wears to the winter formal. With the lace-up details and rockabilly bangs, the look is an obvious ode to Betty Page, a famous 1950s pinup model who also participated in S&M. Kat likely sees her as an inspiration, at least from an aesthetic point of view, but we could also see this as foreshadowing. Following her retirement, Betty Page expressed many regrets about her modeling career, and Kat feels the same way during the second season, realizing that the confidence she felt while camming didn't resolve her deep-seated self-esteem issues and she's just as insecure as she was before. Become a bad bitch! Just like you did last year. But that wasn't even real! It looked real. That was the point! Unlike Rue, whose black color palette is a reference to her drug problem, Kat's use of black is symbolic of the character's cynical nature and represents mystery, dominance, and pessimism. For Halloween, she dresses as Thana from the 1981 film Miss 45, which is about a mute woman who is assaulted and begins killing men because of the trauma. This is somewhat similar to Kat's situation at the start of the series, when a video of her losing her virginity leaks on the internet. Embarrassed by the attention and feeling violated by the betrayal, Kat decides to reclaim the narrative and her sexuality, but unfortunately, she goes about it in a way that she begins to regret. Multiple characters in Euphoria have sexual relationships with older people, and it's unfortunate that many young viewers will inevitably misinterpret these moments as empowering, when in reality, these characters are being taken advantage of. Many young girls with little knowledge of sex can find themselves in incredibly vulnerable situations with people who will exploit their inexperience. 
we can see this teenage naivete through Kat's exploration of her sexuality and the power dynamic she has with men. She's initially under the assumption that because she's having sex with these guys and feels nothing, that she's won. But the truth is that aside from Ethan, none of them care. They've already gotten what they want from her. Did you come? No. Kat doesn't fully realize how much she's misinterpreted things until she hooks up with Daniel, who had previously dumped her years earlier after she put on weight, something that made a lasting impact on her emotionally. But when he reveals that he doesn't remember their relationship at all, it shatters the illusion. Kat's makeup is more dramatic than many of the other girls, playing into the gothic and punk influences in her clothing. She wears colorful lipstick on numerous occasions, a rare occurrence on the show, and we can interpret this as her attempting to look sexier and more adventurous. Kat's makeup looks aren't as experimental as Jules's or Maddie's, but she isn't afraid of a little color either. We often see her wearing green eyeshadow, which can represent materialism and greed, referencing all of the things Kat is willing to do for money and validation. This color also makes Kat the literal embodiment of a green-eyed monster, someone who's envious of others. When she quits camming in the second season, Kat's wardrobe becomes softer, with the character wearing more skirts and dresses, representative of how she's no longer playing the dominating role she was earlier. This is similarly shown through her color palette, with a character wearing significantly less red this season. The character's inability to make up her mind and the confusion about her relationship also results in busier patterns on all of her clothing. Lexi While Lexi doesn't appear very much in the first season, her role is heavily expanded in the second, quickly becoming a fan favorite. During the first season, Lexi is nothing more than Rue's childhood best friend, desperately yearning to go back to the way things were, and even allowing herself to be manipulated by Rue in the hopes of mending their relationship. There's subtext that Lexi may have a crush on Rue, but that's quickly forgotten about in favor of a relationship with Fezco in the second season, which is still adorable, but not quite what I wanted to see for the character. Much like her friendship with Rue, Lexi is similarly overlooked by other people in her life, including her other friends, who only ever speak to her when they need something, leaving her desperate for a human connection. It doesn't end there either, with even her family members ignoring her in favor of Cassie, who Lexi often negatively compares herself to, and it makes for one of her biggest insecurities early on. Exhibiting a high level of emotional intelligence, intuition, and traditional book smarts, Lexi eventually learns to appreciate herself for who she is, not what she looks like, which gives her a level of confidence that the other characters lack. Extremely perceptive and shrewd, Lexi knows more about the other characters than she lets on, and the second season ends with Lexi performing a play of her own creation that details the lives of her and her friends, airing out their dirty laundry in front of the entire school. Because Lexi's character was depicted as a wallflower over the course of the series, this comes as a complete surprise, and shows that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. And although Lexi is soft-spoken, that doesn't mean she's weak, and she defends herself and her friends on more than one occasion. I bet it's brain damage. You're being fucking rude. No, he wasn't! He was bluffing, and you fell for it because you're a fucking idiot! Her storyline during the second season also directly juxtaposes her sisters, highlighting their differences and similarities. Over the course of the season, we see how both have been affected by their father's abandonment. Both also enter new relationships, and both betray their friends in one way or another. However, these things seem to bring out the best in Lexi, while they bring out the worst in Cassie. Similar to her personality, Lexi's style is subdued, featuring classic preppy elements like Peter Pan collars, plaid, cardigans, hair bows, Mary Janes, and argyle, which all reference her intellectualism. Out of all the characters, Lexi is perhaps the least experienced when it comes to romance and relationships, hence her more conservative wardrobe. Even on Halloween, her costume is more funny than it is flirty, with the character donning a wig and a mustache in order to look like Bob Ross, something that the other characters tease her about. The whole point of Halloween is to look attractive. No, it's not. Oh, really? You do me a favor and you count how many girlfriends of yours are dressed up like 50-year-old men. Report back to me. This costume reveals a crucial aspect of Lexi's relationship with her body. She doesn't want to be sexualized, not after seeing what that did to Cassie. Like all of the characters, Lexi's style takes notes from a specific time period, 
the 1960s, 70s, and 90s, which is similar to Rue, showing the bond that they have with one another. Lexi only ever experiments with her style at the winter formal, donning a blue satin dress and choker that look vastly different than anything she's worn up until that point. And it's at this dance that we see Lexi get drunk and speak her mind for one of the first times, with the dress being symbolic of this uninhibited and somewhat daring moment. Lexi is probably the least experimental when it comes to makeup, which plays into how her character doesn't want to be seen as just a pretty face. In the second season, we see her with an occasional dark lip, which is typically present when she's attempting to appear more mature. Her hair also plays into the character's desire to be taken seriously, usually wearing her hair up in buns or ponytails. In the first season, Lexi often wears black, which helps her keep up her wallflower act while simultaneously symbolizing the character's unhappiness and loneliness. You could also see the color choice as her character being in mourning, grieving the absence of her father and lamenting her dying friendship with Rue. In the second season, she begins wearing more colors like brown, red, and white, which gives the audience a visual cue that there's more to her than meets the eye. She coincidentally begins wearing red after she meets Fez, who is one of the first people who attempts to understand her beyond a surface level, and the color is a direct reference to her feelings for him. Meanwhile, the brown in her wardrobe is symbolic of the character's maturity, honesty, and dependability, traits that she was forced to develop as a result of her father's addiction, mother's neglect, and Cassie's irresponsibility. During the second season, her outfits become more elevated and fashion-forward, in part because her character had more screen time, but also because the show as a whole was less focused on realism than it was previously. During the first season, the wardrobe department actively wanted the clothing to look like things real teenagers would wear, with Heidi Bevan saying, quote, I would go to high schools, not to be a creep, but I'd sit outside and watch teens when they would get out of school, just to see what was really going on with how they dress, how they have access to clothes, and where they shop. This resulted in a somewhat believable and achievable look for the first season, with the outfits actually influencing Gen Z trends. But the process for the second season was incredibly different, with Bevan saying, quote, In terms of style, I played it safe the first season. I really tried to be conscious of making it realistic. This season, that went out the window, because I just wanted to have fun. This shift allowed for a lot more designer and custom pieces to make their way onto the characters, and in Lexi's case, this meant a lot of Mew Mew. Although these pieces are way out of a real high schooler's budget, in the context of the show they work because they remain true to the character's personality, and perhaps most crucially, they're not instantly recognizable as designer items, unlike, say, Emily in Paris, where you're left wondering how she got her hands on so much Chanel. What's interesting to note about Lexi's use of Mew Mew is that the brand's identity matches her own. The little sister to Prada, a brand that both Cassie and Maddie wear over the course of the series, Mew Mew has more of a coquettish and creative reputation, and Lexi is similarly seen as more innocent and quirky than the two girls who are her big sisters. Cassie Perhaps one of the most contentious characters on the show, people either love Cassie or hate her, which I think is missing the point. All of the characters in Euphoria have personal trauma that has negatively impacted their lives, and as a result, they often make choices that aren't great. Cassie has a severe case of daddy issues, and she is desperately searching for love and attention in order to fill the void that he left behind. And she's willing to ignore any red flags in the hopes that she's found the one, preferring to be unhappy and in a relationship than alone and forced to confront herself. She's terrified of being abandoned and is dependent on the people closest to her, which more often than not, winds up pushing them further away. She's also been sexualized from a very young age, which has caused her to think that her worth is directly tied to her appearance and what she does in the bedroom, making her an easy target. Cassie gives 100% of her love, attention, and energy to the other person, which leaves her with nothing for herself. And over the course of the show, she grows to truly hate the person that she's become. Cassie starts off the show in a relationship with McKay, but he refuses to commit to her because of her reputation, which causes Cassie to lash out in response, which only succeeds in hurting herself more. The first season ends with the character having an abortion and swearing off of boys, vowing to take the time to get to know herself. But unfortunately, old habits die hard, and in the second season, she becomes involved with Nate Jacobs, her best friend Maddie's abusive ex-boyfriend. 
While her betrayal of Maddie can't be brushed under the rug, it's important to note that Cassie was in an incredibly vulnerable place emotionally and mentally, and Nate is an expert at misleading and manipulating people, having done it to two more headstrong characters like Jules and Maddie in the past. While it does take two to tango, someone has to lead, and in this case, it's Nate. Cassie is by no means innocent, and her cowardice definitely doesn't do her any favors, but her naivete and trustworthy nature has been exploited by men on numerous occasions, so it's no surprise that she reaches a breaking point this season. If there was one word I would use to describe Cassie's style, it would be basic. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but in a literal sense. She doesn't wear anything experimental or creative, it's just generically popular. Her outfits feature quintessential 2010s trends combined with splashes of the 1980s, things like denim jeans, lettuce hems, and crop sweaters, which combined make her look like the stereotypical girl next door, which reflects how she attempts to come off as innocent and naive in front of boys. Compared to the rest of the characters, Cassie's color palette is far more consistent almost exclusively appearing in blue, pink, or white, with her inability to deviate from these colors reflecting how unadventurous she is, while the individual colors represent different aspects of Cassie's personality. Cassie's color palette also complements Nate's, who often wears blue himself. White symbolizes purity and innocence, and while Cassie is one of the more sexually active characters on the show, her mindset when it comes to romance is incredibly naive, with the character routinely choosing men who she knows are no good for her. She also wears white when she's attempting to garner sympathy, playing into the character's cowardice and inability to take responsibility for her actions. Blue is used to symbolize sensitivity, sadness, and loneliness, while pink is often associated with love, flirtatiousness, and traditional femininity. The combination of these colors reflects Cassie's deep-seated desire to be loved, which winds up creating the majority of her problems throughout the series. Cassie typically wears lighter shades, which are not only more innocent and youthful looking, but also less eye-catching, reflecting Cassie's lack of confidence compared to other characters like Jules or Maddie. It also shows how much of a pushover and a coward Cassie is, afraid of causing conflict even if she's in the right. On the rare occasions when she does wear darker shades, it's typically because she's emotionally distressed or feeling confused about her situation, which often leads to her character behaving recklessly. During the first season, Cassie's makeup is similar to her clothing in how conventionally attractive and simple it is. We don't see her wear any bold shadows or eye-catching glitter. Instead, she looks fairly natural. At least, that's what a man would think. Cassie has always prioritized her relationships over her well-being, and has barely developed a personality of her own, and this lack of self-expression is reflected in her makeup. This is why the makeup during her ice skating sequence is incredibly significant, as it represents a version of Cassie where she's strong and confident and unafraid of others' opinion about her. It's a life that Cassie yearns for. With its dramatic blue shadow and rhinestones, it's also a callback to her childhood, a time when she hadn't been betrayed by all of the men in her life, which is a direct contrast to her current situation. Her other bold look during the first season is on Halloween, where she dresses up as Alabama Worley from the 1993 film True Romance. Alabama is a call girl who falls in love with one of her clients, whose profession winds up putting them in harm's way. The film itself is a male fantasy, playing into the trope of the hooker with a heart of gold, in the same vein as Pretty Woman or Moulin Rouge. And Alabama remains hopelessly devoted to her man even amidst gunfire and bloodshed, which is a direct parallel to Cassie's relationship with McKay, and eventually her relationship with Nate. Cassie is a supposed whore who turns over a new leaf when she starts up these relationships, and she does everything in her power to make these men happy, whether that means swallowing a live fish or betraying all of her friends. But the men themselves only appreciate her on a surface level. The significance of her having to wear this outfit twice foreshadows her relationships. McKay forces her to change out of the costume because he's embarrassed of her, and their relationship eventually ends because he's unable to move on from these prejudices. Meanwhile, Nate's relationship with Cassie mirrors her experience wearing the costume at Daniel's, with Nate belittling her when he doesn't get exactly what he wants and the character ending up in tears. In season two, we see the character's makeup become more experimental as she attempts to get Nate's attention, who for the most part, ignores her. 
This wide array of looks that range from schoolgirl inspired to Southern Belle also showcase how insecure Cassie is and that she thinks the only way to get someone to like her is by pretending to be someone else. One of the only times he actually acknowledges her existence is when Cassie dresses up like Maddie, complete with her signature two-piece set, baby hairs, and winged eyeliner, the latter being a direct recreation of Maddie's carnival makeup the past season. Although Cassie doesn't outwardly acknowledge this, it's obvious to the audience and to the other characters that she's nothing more to Nate than Maddie's replacement, and she begins actively dressing the part. The first season ended with Cassie bareface and stripped down, symbolic of her desire to focus on herself. But in stark contrast, the second season ends with her brokenhearted and bleeding, dressed up as a caricature of someone else, someone who Nate abused and took advantage of, which may symbolize the continuation of this cycle into the third season. Maddie. As a child, Maddie competed in beauty contests, which instilled a sense of confidence and competitiveness in her that continued into her teens, leading her to becoming a cheerleader. It was around this point that she first met and began dating Nate, but the two break up when the series begins, with Maddie publicly hooking up with another guy in order to upset him. They eventually get back together, but the relationship grows more and more toxic, with Maddie pushing Nate's buttons and Nate eventually reacting with physical violence. Despite all of this, Maddie stays with Nate until the end of the season, where they both finally admit to each other that their relationship isn't healthy. In the second season, Maddie is conflicted between her head and her heart. She knows that her relationship with Nate was dysfunctional, but she can't deny her lingering feelings for him either, and she genuinely considers getting back together. When she finally discovers that Cassie and Nate have been sleeping with one another, Maddie is heartbroken, but not because of Nate. It's because Cassie, someone she treated like a sister, betrayed her. Maddie is easily the most extroverted of all the characters and often finds herself the center of attention something that she revels in. Even while cheerleading, Maddie's dramatic hair and makeup instantly lets the audience know who the boss is, and we know that when she's in her element, she's unstoppable. Incredibly direct and confrontational, she isn't afraid to say what's on her mind, although she often lacks tact and forethought, which can get her into trouble and cause misunderstandings. Maddie is also incredibly manipulative and selfish, willing to say or do anything as long as it benefits her. When Nate is involved, Maddie can be extremely immature and cruel, which can be said for him as well, and the two regularly bring out the worst in one another. We can see that Maddie is unafraid to use her sexuality to her advantage, and her appearance is carefully curated to highlight her assets, made to appeal to both men and women. This is also why at her weakest point, after Nate assaults her, she begins to cover up more, not only because she's attempting to hide the bruises, but also because he's taken away her confidence, making it impossible for her to leave him. Her signature outfits are her two-piece sets, and they're so ubiquitous to the character that when Cassie begins copying her, it's the first thing she starts to wear. These matching sets not only reveal how methodical Maddie is when it comes to her appearance, but also that she's a creature of habit which is part of the reason why she finds it so difficult to get away from Nate, and why she can't seem to stop making choices that she knows are bad for her. Her style is influenced by trends of the 90s and 2000s, like low-rise jeans, mules, and halter tops, and her clothing makes deliberate references to celebrities of that time period like Eve and Aaliyah. In general, Maddie seems to have a fondness for powerful women, performing Madonna's Lucky Star at a pageant, becoming inspired by Sharon Stone in 1998's Casino, and sporting a makeup look that takes notes from Nina Simone. She even wears some outfits that could be an ode to Selena, who Maddie is no doubt inspired by as a Latina herself. Throughout the show, we see Maddie wear various designer brands like Jacques Mousse, Versace, Dolce & Gabbana, and Prada, which obviously a real teen wouldn't be able to afford. But it ties into the character's materialism and her passion for fashion. Dressed as Iris from 1976's Taxi Driver, Maddie's Halloween costume is… interesting to say the least. In the film, Iris is a teenage prostitute who begins a friendship with a psychotic vigilante who wants to save her from these circumstances. This is similar to how Nate views Maddie, and he often fantasizes about killing someone in order to rescue her. Maddie's makeup throughout the series is incredibly precise, with dramatic eyeliner and rhinestones being her signature, and she often color coordinates these looks to her outfits, showing the character's attention to detail. Her makeup's evolution follows the character's story arc, starting off sweeter and subtler in the beginning, but becoming darker as her relationship with Nate gets more toxic. 
With her character being so aggressive and confrontational, many of her looks feature sharp eyeliner that bring to mind the idea if looks could kill, and it's obvious that she's a force to be reckoned with. While Maddie is often in solid prints, the patterns she occasionally wears are loud and feminine, including leopard print, cherries, and dainty flowers. Animal print has been associated with sexually charged characters for decades at this point, with Mrs. Robinson from 1967's The Graduate coming to mind. Both cherries and flowers are associated with youth and innocence, and as a result we often see her wearing these patterns when she's around Nate, who wants her to fit his vision of the perfect woman. Maddie's color palette evolves over the course of the series, with the character wearing purples and blues throughout the first season and green and black throughout the second. Purple is considered a luxurious color, the color of royalty, and Maddie is definitely the queen bee. But she's also greedy and her desire to be more powerful than others can come off as arrogance instead of ambition. One of the character's most memorable looks is also this color, with her custom IMG set becoming a popular Halloween costume. While yes, it probably isn't the best outfit to meet your boyfriend's parents in, it reveals how she's unapologetically herself, and despite Nate's best efforts, he can't control her the way he wants to. The color also comes full circle when she's gifted a purple gown from the woman she's been babysitting for, which represents how she's finally managed to get away from Nate and is on her way to becoming herself again. Maddie first starts wearing black in the first season after Nate assaults her, representing how unhappy she is with her current circumstance but she still finds herself unable to let him go, wearing the color even when they admit they're bad for each other. When they do finally break up, she officially moves away from blue, which as we've mentioned is Nate's signature color, and she wears black for the majority of the season, which represents how she's mourning the end of her relationship with Nate, as well as the disintegration of her friendship with Cassie. It also shows the audience how the events of the previous season have affected her, and while she acts strong, she's still hurting on the inside, Having taken on a job as a nanny for an incredibly wealthy woman, we often see Maddie wearing green when she's at her house, with Maddie perhaps thinking that if she dresses the part, she'll be able to manifest it becoming a reality. It could also symbolize growth and renewal, and with the character wearing green when she physically confronts Cassie, we can infer that she's finally washed her hands of the entire situation. Which character from Euphoria had your favorite style moments? I hope you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye!